Good morning, uh, afternoon, uh, or good evening. It's my great pleasure to open this meeting on behalf of the International Affairs Institute, Instituto Affari Internazionale. Welcome to all of you and many thanks for uh, accepting uh, our invitation, in particular uh, to our panelists uh, and Deputy Foreign Minister Marina Sereni for being with us today. And a special thanks to Action Global Health Advocacy Partnership, uh, our partner in the organization of this meeting. Action is a very dynamic organization dedicated to education, research, and advocacy on global health uh, challenges. As you may already know, our institute is co-chairing uh, one of the G20 engagement uh, groups called uh, Think20, which brings together a large uh, network of study centers working on uh, global governance issues and specifically on the G20 agenda. And uh, in particular, we are coordinating uh, the task force uh, of the T20 that deals with the 2030 Agenda in Development Cooperation. And within this context, uh, the context of this task force, uh, we have been able to develop a specific uh, line of research on food security and nutrition. Uh, food security challenges are indeed uh, part and parcel of the Development Cooperation Agenda and the G20 has a key role to play in promoting cooperation in this field. Food security and nutrition is intrinsically linked to several dimensions of uh, sustainability. We know that even before the pandemic, uh, most countries were far from achieving uh, the targets set in the agenda uh, 2030, and this also applies to food security. We also know that the burden of malnutrition is unequally distributed with many G20 countries largely uh, suffering from uh, high rates of overweight and obesity, while many non-G20 countries are exposed to hunger and food insecurity. Moreover, the pandemic has revealed the weaknesses of increasingly globalized uh, food supply chains, exposing the most uh, vulnerable uh, segments of population, including particularly children, women, the elderly, migrants, to several forms of food insecurity. As you know, the last uh, FAO report uh, is very alarming. It highlights the critical levels that food insecurity and malnutrition have reached uh, as a result uh, of a series of crises uh, triggered by the pandemics, and how far we are now from the goal to end all forms of, of world hunger and malnutrition by 2030. Against this backdrop, the G20 can play, I think, a crucial role in supporting the global fight against hunger and malnutrition in its multiple, multiple forms. The G20 economies produce up to 80% of the world's total uh, uh, cereal pro uh, production and account for a similar share of world agricultural exports. Therefore, G20 countries have a strong responsibility to set the condition for a more equitable and sustainable food systems. Moreover, the G20 countries use up uh, 75% of carbon emissions that the Paris Agreement allocates to food production. This puts at risk the global climate agenda. Even in this regard, the G20 countries hold a special responsibility. One central task of the G20, I would uh, say, is to provide collective and coordinated leadership to take on food crisis and promoting uh, an inclusive approach to food security problems by engaging all stakeholders, uh, both private and public. These are essentially the topics that we have examined in our report sponsored by Action, which was published a few days ago. Uh, the study coordinated by my colleague, uh, Daniele Fattibene, looks into the health dimension of food security, and in particular discusses how the One Health approach can be 
implemented, taking into account the need to transform food and nutrition systems and the diet models. It also addresses the issue of the financial gap, which is particularly relevant for the G20, and provides a number of recommendations and proposals regarding the role of the G20 in the field. The study was published ahead of the Matera uh, ministerial meeting. Uh, let me stress that the Matera declaration has been, uh, I think, an important stepping stone an important achievement of the Italian presidency of the G20. I would say a, a call for collective action, which can contribute to inducing policymakers to concentrate their minds on the comprehensive set of measures that are needed to adapt the food and nutrition system to the old and, and new challenges. Uh, now, uh, all, all eyes will be on what the G20 leaders will say in the final communique of the G20 summit at the end of October, but of course other milestones will also be of paramount importance, including uh, of course the UN Food System Summit and the upcoming uh, pre-summit next week. But worth mentioning are of course also the biodiversity conference in China in October, the COP26 in November, which is expected to have a major focus on sustainable agriculture and, and the nutrition and growth summits, which will be hosted by the, uh, this series of meetings will offer a crucial opportunity for decision makers and stakeholders to renew and possibly deepen their financial and political commitments to cope with the problems of malnutrition and food security. And I would uh, uh, therefore suggest that in this meeting, it would be interesting uh, not only to discuss uh, what has been achieved so far, including uh, under the Italian presidency, uh, the prior declaration, but also how these future events can help uh, develop the implementation process. I think, generally speaking, that the comprehensive approach promoted also by the Italian presidency and which has been at the center of the debate uh, within the G20, can help address food security and nutrition in, uh, in a horizontal way and serve also uh, potentially as an important legacy for the future G20 presidency, which uh, will have also the task of drawing on the results of the um, uh, many events, important events that I just uh, mentioned. So I'm sure that thanks also to the very qualified uh, panel, the panel that we have and that we we'll, uh, kick off uh, our discussion. And again, many, many thanks uh, to our debate will offer many uh, in useful insights. And uh, now I, um, I don't know if now is already with us uh, uh, Vice Minister Sereni. Uh, I don't think so. So we, she will certainly join us a little bit later. In this case, I will go. We give the floor immediately to my colleague uh, Daniele Fattibene, who will chair the panel for for the first uh, for the beginning, uh, the, the actual beginning of this meeting. So many many thanks again. I very much look forward to, to our debate. Daniele, over to you. Thanks, Ettore, and thanks everyone for uh, being here virtually today. We're very pleased to have this uh, webinar at the end of a nice uh, uh, research trip we had with our colleagues from, uh, from Action. Um, Vice Minister Sereni will join uh, in uh, uh, 15, 20 minutes, so I think we can start uh, the panel. Uh, as Ettore said, nutrition and food security are very cross-cutting themes that touch upon several dimensions of our lives and also of the policymaking process. So we decided to build and design this panel to have a very broad representation of uh, speakers and institutions and actors. Um, so I would like to, first of all, to introduce you all uh, the panel of today. Uh, so I'm very pleased to have uh, with us uh, Lina Mahi, the Technical Officer on Nutrition from the WHO, uh, Mrs. Gerda Verburg, uh, Coordinator of the Sun Movement, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mira Shekhar, uh, Global Lead for Nutrition uh, at the World Bank, uh, 
Bobby John, uh, Managing Director of Equitas and Member uh, of Action and Global Health Advocacy Partnership. And last but not least, uh, uh, Mr. Kuraya Yoshihiro, uh, Minister Councillor of the Embassy of Japan in Italy and Deputy Permanent Representative of Japan. I would like to start immediately from Lina. Uh, we know that uh, COVID-19 has had uh, several impacts on, uh, on nutrition. Your organization has been working uh, uh, very much uh, to uh, understand what were the main implications of the pandemic on, on food security and nutrition. So I would like uh, to give immediately the floor for a first remark on how you uh, uh, reacted to the, to the pandemic and how you're working to uh, tackle uh, the challenges it has, uh, it has brought. Thank you very much, uh, Daniele, and uh, thank you also for Ettore for already setting the scene uh, of the discussion. And it's a pleasure to, to speak to you today um, and uh, in this virtual round table. And it's very timely as we are a few days before the, the pre-summit of the Food Systems Summit, which was already uh, mentioned. And these are really um, strange and confusing times, uh, which really demand for clarity, clarity of purpose and clarity of action. So the topic that we are discussing um, um, is really, really relevant and uh, discussing the global malnutrition pandemic, because I saw that the title says nutrition pandemic. So um, but even before the, the COVID uh, pandemic, the world was already experiencing this malnutrition pandemic with unacceptably high levels of stunting of children, wasting, overweight, micronutrient deficiencies for women of reproductive age, um, and also overweight, obesity, and diet-related non-communicable diseases. And I'm not going to repeat all the figures uh, uh, now uh, because of time, but I mean, this, we kind of lived with this knowledge before the, the, the COVID pandemic and, and, and then came the COVID pandemic. And in fact, the, the, the paper that you have produced, um, I have read it with, with, with great interest and it, it really uh, shows how this pandemic is impacting us in the areas of health, our economies and our societies at large. And, um, I, I also heard uh, Ettore already refer to the, to the report that was launched uh, actually last week on the state of food security and nutrition, which I would slightly correct is not an FAO publication. It, they were the pen holder, but it, was a, it is a publication of five um, UN agencies, uh, which is really important. And um, that, that, that report really um, tells us that um, the COVID-19 pandemic contributed to the largest single year increase in global hunger in decades. 118 million more people face hunger in 2020 than in 2019, and that is staggering. And what really struck me also in, in the SOFI 2021 report is a, is a figure which shows the modeling results of undernourishment under the COVID-19 scenario. And under that uh, COVID-19 scenario, about 30 million more people will face hunger by 2030 than if the pandemic had not occurred, revealing really persistent effects of the pandemic on global food security. So for me, that was again like a, a realization, like, wow, what is happening now? will still have effects on people all over the world by 2030. And on top of that, that effect will be different in different regions. And the SOFI report shows that it's the greater inequality in access to food that is mostly responsible for the observed difference. So that word inequality, I think, is something that we need to remember and might have to come uh, back to. So then I would just like to zoom briefly zoom into um, the on food systems and their impact on health, because that is a word again that I've not heard enough, especially in the preparation of the, the pre summit and, and the summit itself of food systems that the centrality of health that we need to know it's not just about agriculture. Uh, it's not just about sustainability, but this is about health. And our food systems 
are a leading contributor to the ravages of climate change and all forms of malnutrition. And they deliver our diets, but today they don't deliver healthy diets and the food systems make us ill. So we need to really transform, and that's also the objective really of, or the aim of the Food Systems Summit to draw attention to the need to food systems transformation. And to realize this, we need to have a shared vision and a shared narrative. And WHO um, has been advocating and has developed a new narrative on food systems that puts health at the center of our food systems and embraces the the interconnectedness of humans, animals, and the planet that sustains us. And this narrative um, highlights five major pathways through which food systems impact health using a one health approach. And this was also already mentioned. And I will put later in, in the chat more information about that new narrative. And so to conclude my, my initial remarks, I'm, I'm very pleased that the G20 and the Matera Declaration have put great emphasis on the importance of promoting science-based and holistic One Health approach. And of course, the G20 are the most economically powerful and influential group of countries in the world, and they can make a real difference. But a declaration is not good enough. Uh, it's only a declaration. It's what we then as as member countries, um, what we do with it. And so we really need to push, and I think civil society also has an important role there, to push ourselves into a really operational can-do mode. And WHO is also doing this. And just yesterday, um, uh, there was an announcement that WHO has established a One Health initiative in the division that I'm working, working under, uh, the division of healthier populations. And that um, One Health initiative will provide strategic coordination and will um, also um, um, develop like a roadmap or a strategic framework on how to take this forward within our organization in, at the three levels, but also outside uh, with the, for example, with the Tripartite Alliance, um, of FAO, OIE, and, 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 and WHO, and UNEP that has also joined. So um, I will leave it at that uh, as my initial comments and or, or back to... Yeah, uh, I'm very happy that uh, Vice Minister Sereni has joined us. Uh, uh, we very appreciate that. We know you were uh, stuck in, a, in another meeting, so we are very pleased to have you with us. Uh, Vice Minister Sereni, the floor is yours for um, um, a speech on how the Italian government is working uh, with the international partners to uh, tackle uh, malnutrition uh, crisis uh, uh, all over the world and your work in the G20 as well has been remarkable. So we are again very, very happy that you joined us and I'll give you the floor uh, to you for, for your speech. Thank you, Daniel. I'm very happy to participate uh, to this webinar, which addresses uh, a crucial topic, uh, the crucial topic of global nutrition pandemic. Indeed, uh, this is an effective way to describe the crisis we face. Uh, ministers of Foreign Affairs and Ministers of Development Cooperation jointly met in Matera, as uh, the previous speakers uh, uh, mentioned last June 29, to set the pace for an effective collective action for global food in the community to endorse a call to action to address emerging food crises and achieve the zero hunger goal by 2030. <clears throat> the aim was to focus on global food security and to build a global alliance backed to the, by the political leadership uh, of the G20. In this framework, the Matera Declaration uh, is not enough, but can be a turning point in the G20 countries' efforts to achieve food security. Next week, we will host in Rome the pre-summit of the food systems, uh, a unique opportunity to take stock of the work undertaken during the last two years on the global food system, uh, while at the same time uh, identifying the most promising, uh, promising solutions. Uh, achieving a consensus on the Matera Declaration 
was not obvious because uh, of the difference on major issues concerning the response to food insecurity. Uh, however, diplomacy consists in finding the common ground and building upon it. I believe, therefore, that the way the G20 members and their partners prioritized the food security in their response to the COVID-19 crisis, as clearly reflected in the declaration, will prove useful for developing countries. Uh, the Italian presidency has placed the sustainable development agenda at the center of its uh, G20 priorities with the three Ps, uh, people, planet and prosperity, in order to promote the achievement of sustainable development goals in all regions and countries of the world. The joint foreign and development ministerial meeting of Matera has been a new, uh, a good news, uh, for, the, for the first time, foreign affairs and development ministers jointly meet in a common ses session. This demonstrated a, share, a, a shared awareness of the close link between foreign policy, politics and development. <clears throat> the Matera Declaration, uh, as I said before, is a call to action for the entire international community. It requires us being united and ambitious, uh, a leadership role that the G20 countries cannot shy away from, uh, while promoting an inclusive approach with all interested parties, uh, private and public, and pursuing ambitious but concrete and feasible programs. In the Matera Declaration, you will not find all the possible actions necessary for food security, but the most important priorities and areas of interventions uh, both for urgency and for their scope of structural improvements. In particular, we focused on strengthening social protection measures and programs, which are fundamental since COVID-19 continues to affect persons in vulnerable settings, especially in developing countries. Attention has been given to guarantee safe and adequate nutrition which requires concrete social protection measures. We mentioned the increase in catalytic investments for food security as a part of the sub substantial COVID-19 emergency funds and recovery plans. As a matter of fact, agriculture is a sector in which the economic risk in developing countries is still very high. <clears throat> we have not forgotten the importance of adapting agriculture and food system to climate change, not now in, in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a reality, a, a, a very harsh reality, since evidence shows that climate has negative consequences on food security, especially for small farmers and family farming. The G20 will seek to increase both public and private investments and public policies for adaptation to climate change with a focus on small farm farmers, small farmers, and above all, a transversal focus on gender equality, supporting female entrepreneurs and youth in rural areas of developing countries. In addition, we found common grounds on one of the issues that will be further discussed at, as, at the upcoming Food System Summit, keeping international food trade open and strengthening local diversified sub supply chains for fresh and nutritious food. This will be key in view of the achievement of SDGs 2. Uh, COVID-19 has shown the importance of international trade when local shops reduce access to food. Uh, this is why strengthening the local supply chains and better connecting rural food production with urban consumers is crucial to face emergency. Today, when we adapt global policies to the 2030 agenda, while resuming the pace of the sustainable economic and social life after the pandemic, we cannot fail to adopt a holistic approach. Uh, such an approach must recognize the close link between human, animal, and environmental health that emerged during COVID-19, uh, <clears throat> The One Health approach that was mentioned before is the strategy we endorsed 
to prevent zoonotic diseases and the emergence of antimicrobial uh, resistance for global uh, food security. The relevance of the Matero Declaration is also given by the inclusion in it of the Food Coalition, a global alliance for food security and a useful tool for implementing the priorities of the Declaration. Uh, it is itself a call to action and a flexible instrument designed to support the commitments and solutions that G20 countries, as well as development agency and partner countries, adopted with the aim of relating the planet from the toll of anger. Uh, finally, yet importantly, I would like to mention the re relevance of strengthening multilateralism, working together in a constructive way amid the different views, but with a common objective is the main result we achieved in Matera. Our efforts, of course, did not stop in Matera, rather they will find concrete follow-ups during the rest of our G20 presidency and the future activities of our development cooperation. Let me just mention as an example the second edition of the financing common that Italy will host in, the, in October and will pro, that will provide a precious occasion to invite the other 450 public development banks to consider investing on sustainable food system and on food security. Thank you for your attention and uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, I excuse me for my uh, being late. Thanks a lot, Vice Minister. Um, I think you touched upon uh, several uh, uh, important issues, uh, uh, the need to have a holistic approach, uh, the fact that we are all connected, the humans, ecosystems, uh, animals, uh, uh, and the importance of multilateralism. We know that uh, this year will be uh, crucial. Uh, uh, there are a lot of meetings uh, coming uh, uh, in the next uh, weeks and months, and we need to connect uh, all the dots uh, because we need to work together towards uh, the same goal. Um, I would like now to give the floor to uh, Herda Verburg. Um, also, Lina, in her intervention, spoke about the vulnerable, the most fragile, and the fact that we already lived in a malnutrition uh, uh, pandemic uh, in terms of uh, all forms uh, of malnutrition. In your perspective, what has COVID triggered in, a, in this already fragile and, and, and problematic context, and how do you know this uh, fragile people need to be taken into account when we, uh, you know, work and we try to speak with the decision makers? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, and thank you, Your Excellency. Um, from my previous uh, life as a Minister of Agriculture, Nature, and Food Quality, I know that if the Parliament is calling you. Uh, you shouldn't keep them waiting. And if you then jump in, even though you're a little bit late, you are, uh, um, you are excused. So thank you very much for having me here. And thank you, uh, um, Italy, for the great leadership for the G20. And your very, very, very active um, involvement and approach on food systems uh, and health and sustainability. I have read this excellent uh, uh, report developed uh, by the uh, by Action, um, but also the recommendations to the G20 leadership and hopefully uh, the decision making by the G20 summit in October this year. And there are six recommendations uh, um, in this field, and I'd like to make uh, uh, nine remarks to even further improve them, because that is the lesson that COVID is learning, uh, teaching us. This is a systemic approach, and you cannot only improve nutrition by a perspective of nutrition and by, from a perspective of health. You also need to look through a food uh, 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 lens. So um, forgive me that I make some remarks to even sharpen the recommendations on, um, on how to take it forward. In the first recommendation, it is, um, of course, it's focused on the lower middle income countries. And there is a proposal to, or there is an emphasis on the um, extended debt suspension service initiative for countries until the uh, end of the year. My suggestion would be to take a step further, and there are a lot of financial uh, 
um, institutions involved, including the World Bank. Mira Shekhar is here. She's also the chair of the Sun Movement Executive uh, Committee. Uh, um, so the World Bank is a committed uh, member of the Sun Movement. Um, think about creating debt swaps uh, that can be invested by the government uh, so that governments can really uh, invest in improving health uh, and nutrition, but also in changing the food systems, because there is no country without challenges in the food systems uh, from a nutritional, from a people's perspective, but also from a planet's uh, perspective, sustainability. And most of the countries also have the uh, social protection or the prosperity uh, challenge here. So my um, uh, suggestion is please make the step further uh, make it debt swaps to be focused on investments in better food, healthier uh, food and nutrition. My second is in the same recommendation um, where the G20 should make a strong plea for the OECD to uh, use the marker for nutrition. And I think uh, COVID is, uh, is, uh, has, is, is teaching us, is telling us and the numbers are in the excellent uh, action uh, report, they are clear, and we are not at the end of COVID. Instead of using the marker, the um, uh, OECD countries should be encouraged to step up because human capital is the capital for every capital for every country to uh, build a better uh, prosperity for the country and to uh, really invest in social economic development. Without human capital, a country will not be able to really create social economic uh, progress. And when you get nutrition right, the physical, but also the cognitive development of, uh, of people and the productivity um, uh, development will uh, evolve very likely. So scale up, step up in investment in, uh, in nutrition, including in, uh, um, in malnutrition prevention through healthier food systems. The third is um, on, the, on, the, for, on the increase of government spending for health. Um, of course, that should be increased if possible, but not only health. If you focus on health, the focus is very often on the curation of uh, uh, malnutrition. And the Sun Movement is learning in uh, 64 member countries that the focus should be on prevention. So prevent um, uh, uh, malnutrition, and then you should invest in your whole food systems, not only the production, but also the availability, the affordability. So social protection is there again, um, and the accessibility for everyone, uh, access to healthy food, starting with uh, maternal uh, uh, nutrition, of course, and uh, focusing on the first thousand days. The fourth is, and that is uh, for that reason, Your Excellency Marina Sereni, I'm also very happy that you are still here. Um, there is a strong need to sort out a kind of confusion between food security and nutrition security. And still there are too many ministers and too many policy advisors and makers who think that we need to produce more food. We need to support farmers to produce more. It's not the case. We are already producing enough. It's a matter of the food value chain, producing in a more sustainable way, more biodiverse, making sure that the connection between the producers and the consumers is the right one, making sure that people can afford and access a healthy food. So please put on your agenda and I will praise your leadership forever, I promise here, the Italian leadership for sorting out once and forever the, 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 the discussion and the confusion between food security and nutrition security. And it's a crucial one. Don't underestimate it. And I've been a minister of agriculture myself. Um, five um, in the report is also the recommendation for the government to um, incentivize what they want to see when it comes to uh, to uh, uh, good behavior and what they don't want to see uh, on in the field of nutrition and health for companies. And my strong uh, advice would be focus on incentives and uh, and uh, and um, taxes. So carrots and sticks hand in hand, so that those companies who behave where 
can be, uh, behave well, can be a shining examples for those companies who don't behave and then don't hesitate to uh, have taxes uh, for them, but make sure that you loop back the revenues of, the, of these taxes to better food, better health, better nutrition and healthy uh, and sustainable food systems. So give a direction to the taxes that you uh, are raising. Then um, the focus on ending uh, subsidies for unhealthy food. I think it could be smart uh, and more successful to redirect these subsidies. It's quite a lot uh, of money and most of them is within the G20 countries. So there's 600 billion um, uh, agriculture and food subsidies each year. If um, we could redirect them to support the transition of our food systems toward nourishing people, nourishing the planet and creating prosperity at a country level, then it would make a big, big difference because for all changes, uh, we know there is need of funding. So don't cut because then you are uh, challenging the, the, the enemies of any change but just redirect to support what you, what you want to see and do naming and faming, and if need be, do naming and shaming. Then the uh, Italian presidency um, is telling that you are, are grouping together agriculture, finance, and development. Um, great, but please add health there, because too often when it comes to food systems, the health perspective is left out, as Lina already uh, explained, make um, it a joint approach, as was already said also by your uh, deputy minister, uh, Madame Serena. And um, um, my, my plea would be that in October, um, the G20 could um, support, maybe it's a little bit uh, too late, but in the run-up, uh, focus on strongly focus the IDA replenishment. The IDA replenishment from the World Bank is very much focused on uh, the transition of food systems and on nutrition being the human capital and the investment for improvement. So G20 could play an important role, not only in Washington, but also with the regional uh, development banks so that they put their money where their mouth is and are really investing in this systemic approach. Semi-final remark, um, I embrace the suggestion, very much the su suggestion of the G20 making commitments uh, because of the uh, leadership and for g in uh, December hosted by uh, Japan and 500 million people lifting out of uh, malnutrition would be great, but I encourage uh, every extra step and every extra ambition, but it needs to be measurable at the country level. Finally, um, this is the second report I read about uh, the G20. The previous re report I read was the G20 Fixing Food 2021, an opportunity for the G20 countries to lead. Um, and this is developed by the Economist uh, together with the Barilla Foundation. Um, and I really like also the way they are doing it, getting the food systems right by using a food systems index that is measuring food loss and waste, sustainability, but also the nutrition challenges. Whatever you do um, in the G20 and as G20 uh, uh, leadership, as Italian government, please bring these initiatives together so that we don't end up with a lot of new initiatives that are uh, uh, siloed by themselves and are not coming together because that is what we have to learn. Only if we come together, join forces, work together, then we can uh, 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 fix both the food systems and the health systems and also uh, provide people with the right level of prosperity. Thank you very much, back to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Gerda. We couldn't have a better discussion for, uh, for the paper. So I'm very grateful that you touched upon several uh, issues and topics and we really look forward to expanding the work uh, uh, in the future because uh, this is not an end. So, um, I would like to give you uh, the floor to uh, Mera Shekhar from uh, the World Bank. Uh, Gerda touched upon the uh, issue of resources mobilization. What was your response uh, uh, since the very beginning of, uh, of, uh, of the crisis and how did you handle that? 
Great. Thank you very much, Danielle. And a, and a very big thank you to you, Minister Sereni, for uh, how you have really highlighted in the G20 declaration the focus on uh, not just food security, but food and nutrition security. And at the bank, uh, at the World Bank, we actually do not talk about food security alone at all. We always use the term food and nutrition security. So I hope next versions of the G20 declaration is already referred to there, but I hope we can do that even more. And as you said, the focus on effective and collective action is absolutely critical to moving ahead. So we fully endorse that. Let me, uh, Danielle, before I get into the financing pieces, let me also highlight a few new um, pieces of evidence that have come uh, through actually just this week in a paper that we published in Nature Food uh, on the, uh, in terms of the impact of COVID on, on nutrition outcomes. And what it tells us is that uh, this is going to, as other speakers have said, roll back years of progress that has been made up to now. As Lena said, 149 million stunted children in the world already. Now the COVID crisis will add another 2.6 million or maybe 3.6, depending on a moderate or pessimistic scenario, children to, um, to the numbers of stunted children. Another 9.3 million wasted children and all and so on and so forth. And all of this means that we will have children who, who, whose brains are not well developed, who will be less productive as adults uh, and, and contribute. So that's estimate, we estimate um, 29 or 30 million, uh, $30 billion of lost productivity just because of the increase in stunted, child stunting and wasting and, and maternal anemia linked to that. So those are, those are not small numbers, those are large numbers in terms of global economies. And, and yet uh, the, the, the ability to um, do something about it is, requires very modest investment. So we have anticipated in the past about $7 billion a year that are needed for um, addressing the nutrition um, issues that was pre-pandemic. After the pandemic, we've estimated another 1.2 billion. I'll put the paper on, on the chat line in, in a little while. Um, so it's, it's doable. And as um, Herda was saying earlier, there are many ways to get these resources. Um, but before I get to that, the other side of the spectrum that we haven't talked about is the obesity. And again, we've done some recent research that, that documents that people who, A, um, more than 70% of the overweight obese individuals actually live in low and middle income countries. So it's not a problem of the rich alone, it's a problem of the poor as well. And um, um, we know that obesity increases the risk of mortality linked to COVID by nearly 50% and at the same time increases the risk of being in the ICU by 74%. These are not small numbers again. So we have to address both ends of the malnutrition spectrum. And both are very closely linked to food systems, but also very closely linked to health system. And the health system is responsible not just for treatment, it's also responsible for preventive care. Um, so preventive nutrition is very much part of the health system. Um, in terms of uh, financing, um, the numbers tell us, and I'm writing the Global Nutrition Report financing chapter, and, and what we are learning is that we anticipate uh, a 9% decline in ODA, Overseas Development Aid, um, over the next several years. And that will not recover until 2028, which will be very late. From domestic financing point of view, we anticipate somewhere between two to seven percent um, decline in domestic financing. So clearly, if we keep depending on the on the regular model of financing these issues, uh, it's going to be a very uphill task. 
So what does that, where does that leave us? That leaves us with three potential sources of financing. One is concessional financing, which is like the World Bank uh, and the other multilateral development banks. So thank you to the previous speakers for making a case for IDA uh, 20 replenishment. We are really hoping that will go well and that we can service this agenda, which is so critical. Um, do and probably should be pushing very hard is innovative financing. Um, and and that, should, that will then catalyze other forms of financing. And, and the next session I have to go to, and I'm sorry, I'll have to leave a little bit early, is uh, an innovative financing session with the power of nutrition who are co-financing with IDA, my, many of the investments in, in high burden countries in Africa. Um, and then the third area is as a community have not tapped the private sector as yet. I know, I know Minister Sereni, you in your remarks, you really referred to both innovative and private sector. And I think that's an area I would really think that we can all collectively move forward much more. Um, and lastly, um, uh, uh, somehow increasing fiscal space in, in countries is absolutely critical for, uh, to, to help with the domestic financing agenda. And that, that means taxation, again, as you referred uh, to earlier, taxation on unhealthy foods, uh, that is certainly an area where we often refer to as sin taxes. We've done reasonably well with tobacco, but we really haven't done in terms of um, sugar sweetened beverages and, and the like. And I think uh, uh, we can do, we, when I say we collectively can do much more and the World Bank is certainly well positioned to do much more on this as well. And, and the last one um, perhaps is um, repurposing the, the subsidies, both agriculture subsidies, but also appeal subsidies and, and some of those other subsidies as well. Repurposing them so that we create um, a space for investment in, in, uh, develop, in the development agenda, including food and nutrition security. So let me stop there. I can keep going on and on, but um, let me stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mira, and thank you for uh, stressing that it's doable. So we, we do have the chances to address all these issues, to mobilize uh, for the resources and to tackle the challenges uh, that are uh, we are living through and that will be ahead of us in the next years. Um, I would like now to give the floor to Bobby John. Uh, we spoke uh, many times uh, COVID-19 hit hard on the most vulnerable and the least heard uh, are those who are uh, suffering the most. So I would like you to focus in your intervention on this, shedding again the light on, on the most vulnerable, the most fragile, and really try to address how the decision makers need to bring this voice on, on the table uh, when uh, discussing and deciding upon uh, uh, measures and initiatives against malnutrition. Daniela, thank you so much um, for having me on this panel. Uh, Vice Minister, um, thank you so much for your very um, broad and pointed remarks that you have made, setting up the tone for all of our conversations and for my previous speakers. Um, like Daniela said, um, I will focus myself on where, as a physician who moved to become a development advocate over the last six months, I've been drawn back to hearing patients. Um, I wasn't back into the wards. I'm not uh, young enough, but um, I was at least able to be on the other end of telephone lines, having set up a telephone call line for over several thousand people. The questions that I had for those that called were simple. What's your age? What's your height? What's your weight? And with that, today in my head, I have a ongoing BMI calculator that tells me whether this person is undernourished or badly nourished, what the risk factors are. And for the many people for whom their weight height mismatch was on the over side, the questions were, do you have a pulse oximeter? Do you know your blood sugar levels? Do you have any other 
vulnerabilities. What COVID has shown, and that's what the point of this report uh, to me is this, what COVID has exposed is our global vulnerability brought on by hunger and malnutrition, both under and over. Today, you have to be very, very well off to have a normal band BMI. Low, and you could have a lower one, or you could have a higher one because the most affordable food are probably the most unhealthy ones pushed out by our food distribution and production system. And for which the G20 collectively have to take some responsibility and act coordinatedly. It's not merely a matter of telling or incentivizing better food production. That's one aspect of it. I'm also mindful that many of the people who find themselves on either ends of the BMI scales are also food producers, unable to eat healthy. And so there is, and, and who are also at the front end of being disrupted, their lives and livelihoods being disrupted by either a thunder squall or by the absent rains. There's the climate aspect to it. We will come to that later, but it's not merely the production part of it. It's also how we process them and what are the incentives perverse and otherwise that engage and incentivize the presentation of unhealthy foods. People are going out of pocket to fill their bellies and what they're buying is not food, they're buying a deferred payment on bad health. And that is something that should come as a wake up call to us because we cannot afford to treat our way out of this. We have to take a preventive approach towards nutrition because that's central to it. And that's what COVID has essentially shown us. That for those that were in a decent shape as far as nutrition was concerned, neither low nor out of whack, they had a better chance of survival. The numbers from the hospitals, the numbers from the, the morbidity mortality numbers are a stark reminder to us that nutrition is not peripheral. It's not a good to have it is central to human well-being and our collective future. And if we don't figure this out, both as the policy-making world, as the political leadership, then we have missed the biggest alarm bell that's been rung into our ear. Let me pull back to my being my physician mode. You can have acute events, you can have chronicity of conditions, and then you can have an acute assault on chronic conditions. And that's what COVID has again done. It has brought on acute exacerbations on chronic situations. The undernourished, because of disruptions in food supply, because of access issues in many, many countries, because of loss of livelihood, because they had to move, because of shutdowns, they have had on the face of undernutrition, perforce gone hungry. And on the other side, for those that had overweight as their issue or underlying chronic diseases, for them, this became even more of a life and death matter. Both of them are untenable and we need to sort that out. We have heard from previous speakers about a systems approach, about this being intersectoral, about cross-cutting. It's a cross-cutting set of solutions. It is not enough for ministers of foreign affairs and development cooperation alone to come together. You need the ministers of finance and you need the health ministers to be part of this conversation. The G20 has an astonishing opportunity now to bring together all four. I am pleased that Italy begins this three eyes sequence, Italy, Indonesia, India. It's also a sequence of the scale of burden that we also see in the world. But I also see as a scale of opportunity to make the biggest difference in our SDG goals. We have opportunity here. And Minister Sereni, thank you so much for having convened this conversation, shepherd this to see this Matera declaration. You host the twins, FAO and WFP. 
And before His Excellency, the Japanese um, representative speaks, I would like to ask you whether you would want to kind of take on a larger role with the nutrition conversation. It's not about food and agriculture or food programming, but also nutrition for growth and prosperity to take a greater leadership with the sun movement and, 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 and bring the multiple things as uh, uh, Mrs. Swerberg earlier mentioned, bringing people together, the different strands bring ourselves to, and that's a call. I speak both as an Indian and also as part of the group that put together this report. We are looking for leadership, decisive leadership that will say, this is not going to be the way forward. Bring multiple actors forward. Bring a One Health approach and do not ignore the inequity and the inequality that COVID has so glaringly exposed around the world. Thank you so much. I think uh, you uh, perfectly set the stage for our last uh, speaker of today, last but not least, uh, Mr. Kuraya. Um, you as government uh, uh, will be hosting one of the key events, uh, although it's at the end of the year, but it's a crucial event for uh, global food security and nutrition. So what is your perspective, uh, uh, a privileged one, I would say, uh, with regards to, to these issues? Thank you for giving me the floor. And uh, hello, everyone. I'm Kuraya Yoshihiro, Embassy of Japan. And first of all, I would extend my sincere appreciation for Madame Sereni, Vice Minister, and Mr. Grego, Executive Vice President, and other people concerned, provide me with this uh, opportunity. I have just started my assignment here one month ago. I'm a newcomer. My in fact, from the start of the Quindici anni fa, primo segretario dell'ambasciata del Giappone, però la mia abilità a parlare la lingua italiana è molto limitata. Dunque oggi eh, vi chiedo scusa, parlerò in inglese. So uh, let me return to speak in English. And uh, today, uh, as the previous uh, speaker said, I will mainly uh, focus on the uh, uh, Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit issue. But before that, let me begin by talking about the life expectancy of the Japanese people. The life ex expectancy of Japanese women has reached 87 years old, first place in the world. Unfortunately, Japanese men, probably including me, will pass away earlier. But in that case, the life expectancy is also long, reaching 81 years old. Behind these facts, uh, there is a, a balance in nutrition. It goes with the same. Let me explain the balance of nutrition intake in Japan by introducing two examples, two examples. First example, Japanese people eat various foods. Traditionally, rice, fish, fruits and vegetables. Recent years, consumption of meat and daily products increased. Nonetheless, rice and other traditional items are still highly consumed. As a result, Japanese people achieve a good nutritious balance. The point here is nutrition cannot be seen by humans by their naked eyes, but humans can see the food directly by their eyes. For that reason, I think it is quite important to eat a variety of food daily. In Italia, in my view, there is a wide variety of delicious food so that 
how you can implement such a even habit. Having said so, uh, previous speakers uh, pointed out uh, affordability of the healthy food in developing countries are uh, uh, very much problem in this context. Let me uh, uh, let me back to the example of Japan. Second example. In Japan, meals served in the hospital are made with fully taking into consideration the nutritious balance. It is not only the case for the private hospital, but also for common public hospital, it is the case. Medication and nutrition are closely linked and combined in Japan. Considering Japan's aforementioned fact, I think it is quite meaningful to hold the Tokyo Nutrition Program Summit in December. Next, I will explain the outline of Tokyo Nutrition Summit. The dates, 7th and 8th of December. Conference modality, virtual or hybrid to be decided. Organizer, as you know, Japanese government and the participants, various governments, international organizations, academia, civil society, and the private sector. A wide range of participants is anticipated. Teams of summit, total five. Health, food, resilience, accountability, and finance. First, health. The point here is how to integrate the nutrition into the healthcare and the medical system in each country. We are aiming to materialize the notion of universal health coverage, which Japan strongly advocates. Second, who? The point here is how to build and promote the safe, sustainable, healthy food system. This theme is very much relating to the UN Food System Summit, and the pre-summit of that to be held in Rome next week, as you know. Third, resilience. The point here is how to address the malnutrition problem in the fragile and conflict-affected context. context. This is highly connected to the outcomes of the G20, G20 foreign ministers and the European ministers meeting last month. Fourth, accountability. The point here is how to promote data-driven accountability. Fifth, finance. The point here is how to secure new investment and how to drive innovation in nutrition fi financing. And Japan sincerely hopes that these five points will be discussed at the various occasions. Accordingly, Japan welcomes the various opinions and ideas which will be brought to the Tokyo Nutrition Summit so that the summit will become a fruitful opportunity. That is all for today as the outline of the Tokyo Nutrition Summit. Finally, I'd like to uh, conclude my intervention by introducing my personal experience relating to the universal health coverage. In Japan, there is a public social system item, the name of which is Mother and Child Handbook. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, telephone uh, calling. 
Okay. Okay. A mother and the child handbook. In this handbook, the record of a child's growth, for example, height, weight, vaccination, such data and facts are described. Mother preserved this handbook for a long time. I told all of you at the beginning of this meeting, I told all of you uh, at the beginning of this meeting, I was here in Rome 15 years ago. Following the story is at the time. 15 years ago, I had an opportunity to go to some developing country. Then one issue I had to check. That is whether or not I was vaccinated over a communicable disease, the name of which was Japanese encephalitis. Judging from the name of the disease, uh, title of the Japanese, so I thought I had been vaccinated. But just in case, I telephoned to my mother in Japan and checked. Then my mother took the mother child handbook from the old drawer and checked it and said to me, Yoshi, you didn't get the vaccination of the disease. I was surprised, but later I found it was true. Almost all Japanese were supposed to get the vaccination of Japanese encephalitis, but only two prefectures at the northern end of Japan were exempted from the supposed area. My hometown was there. Therefore, I certainly decided to get the vaccination of Japanese encephalitis before the business trip. All mother child handbook saved me my life in the future. Mother child handbook becomes a clue of the health and nutrition. All you should do is just to keep the handbook at home. You don't need the electrical system or program so far for that. I believe mother child handbook can be easily introduced even in the developing country. Uh, in conclusion, medical service in Japan encompasses the nutrition service effectively. Such integrated service should be disseminated worldwide. This means a realization of the notion of the universal health coverage. I'd like to conclude my intervention by sincerely hoping that such a realization of universal health coverage will really take place in the future. Thank you for your attention. Over to you. Thanks a lot, Mr. Kuraya, for your intervention. Uh, since I know that uh, Mera will have to leave us soon, uh, I would like to uh, start a very short, short round of uh, remarks from uh, from the panelists. Uh, I also know the vice minister will uh, will have to leave. And again, thanks for for being with us today. Your words has, are being inspiring, and we know that you will take them um, into account in the next. Uh, in the next month. So again, uh, we look forward to working with you on this uh, um, again. Mira, uh, we know that at the end of the year, important decisions would be made on uh, IDA, replenishment, uh, resources, mobilization. Your words and your thoughts on this uh, uh, before you leave. Yes, sure. Thank you, Danielle. Indeed, um, the um, IDA consultations are, are ongoing. We had a series of uh, consultations in June and, and then um, at the annual meetings in, uh, in October, we will have additional consultations uh, on focusing on IDA 20. And then uh, in uh, December, actually in Tokyo again, if I remember correctly, the dates are 13th uh, and 14th of uh, December, uh, the final conclusion around uh, IDA 20 
uh, will happen. Um, in the lead up to all these conversations, uh, we have really um, focused on some issues that are critical. And there's an, as you know, every IDA has, a, has several themes attached to it. And, and this year, the new theme that has been added on is human capital. And as everyone knows, I, Bobby spoke to that very articulately as well, uh, nutrition is a key component of human capital and a key component of the human capital index that has been estimated for all the IDA countries uh, and, and IBID countries as well. So um, and that's the direction we are um, hoping to move in. Food security, food and nutrition security is also a key cross-cutting theme for um, IDA 20. All of this, of course, needs to be endorsed um, by the, um, um, by the uh, uh, board and the IDA contributors. But we, we have up to now seen a lot of support for all of these um, agendas, especially in the light of the COVID um, crisis. And we're really hoping it will be a successful IDA and that we can then continue to push on, on these issues. Um, let me stop there. There's just one other thing I want to add before I leave, which is when we were talking about repurposing um, existing subsidies to increase fiscal space, um, uh, it, it's interesting to see that some countries are already starting to do that. And, I, and I've just heard this morning from another session that I attended that uh, Indonesia and Egypt are two countries that have actually already started to repurpose some of their subsidies. And it's not just food subsidies, but other regressive subsidies can be repurposed in, in these ways as well. So lots of opportunity is there. It's up to us uh, collectively to um, move in that direction to help make it happen. Thank you again very much for the invitation. And I'm going to have to jump off now. Thank you. Thank you, Mera. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I'll go back to Lina for um, an issue that she uh, spoke about, the need to look at nutrition from several perspectives. We know that uh, the different strands and work streams uh, through which the G20 or other decision-making processes are working do not. What is your perception on this? I, I have seen that you have also shared the, uh, your manifesto, which I strongly recommend everyone to read. What is your um, suggestion and, and approach uh, to, to this? Thank you. Thank you, um, Daniele. And um, first of all, I, I would like, just like to express how I have appreciated um, all the interventions of the different speakers that I, I really, really um, um, agree to. Um, before going into your question, I just because I, I, I think they're important, what I have not heard and could add to the discussion are, are a few points. First of all is the rights-based approach to the issue of malnutrition, the right to food that we need to support, protect and fulfill. Um, and I want to link that to um, one of the um, solution clusters and maybe um, um, a, a potential coalition that could be um, established um, at the Food System Summit and will be discussed in the pre-summit on universal food access, uh, which is kind of the practical interpretation of realizing the, the, the right to food. And there will be um, this session, uh, th this will be discussed in the Action Track 5 session of the pre-summit on the 27th of July at 11.30. And in fact, our uh, Assistant um, um, Director General uh, Naoko Yamamoto will speak uh, on that because it brings together a nice concept, you know, for, for us at WHO, universal um, health coverage, which was mentioned already by uh, Mr. The same concept can apply to universal food access, which kind of uh, looks at food, not just as a commodity, but as a commons and a human right. And that will be discussed. And how can this be linked to the concept of universal uh, health coverage and universal access to education, for example, to bring this, this all together and this will be discussed. 
The second point that I want to uh, briefly mention is that um, we haven't also, I haven't heard the word breastfeeding uh, in this discussion of a healthy diet. Uh, it fulfills the right to food uh, for the most vulnerable that really don't have a voice and cannot yet speak with words. But if they could, my God, how they would advocate for having breast milk. So I just want to highlight this, that it needs to be part of the discussions in Rome um, of the, of the, of the pre-summit and the food system summit itself. It's such a smart investment. Anyway, on that front alone, I, I could continue. And then uh, thirdly, what I want to mention and advocate for is that we don't discuss uh, undernutrition with stunting, wasting, deficiencies, separate from the overweight obesity discussion, because in fact, these problems are linked. And they can be linked to really focusing on the access to or the access to healthy diets. And so to bring it together through double duty actions that address the different types of malnutrition problems. And for example, breastfeeding does so. Breastfeeding prevents undernutrition and, 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 and diet related NCDs later in life. Another example is school feeding, which, which is an excellent double duty action. So a plea for me to bring these silos together. And, 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 and in a coherent approach. And then finally, uh, Italy and also Japan have been sponsors of the Decade of Action on Nutrition. We're actually in the middle of the Decade of Action on Nutrition. And it's also mentioned in the report, but I just want to highlight that the Decade of Action has a, a, a reporting mechanism at the General Assembly that we should really leverage to ensure that countries um, um, uh, are uh, um, held to account in what they do or what they not do in General Assembly, this discussion. So I just um, wanted to, to mention this and maybe uh, for not monopolizing the floor, I will, I will get uh, over to you, uh, Daniele. Thanks, Thanks uh, Lina. Um, Gerda, uh, we know well, there is a lot of expectation for next week uh, pre-summits. We know there are a lot of topics and it's in, impossible to summarize them now, but what is your main expectation uh, in view of the pre-summit next week? Um, it is the first time it's a very brave uh, uh, thing. So thank you very much, uh, um, Italian government, for hosting this and for all people involved and all organizations involved, because it's a new approach. This is not about negotiating a paper. There are many documents, many reports, but um, as I used to say, uh, paper is patient and you can always dra dra draft a new one and renegotiate, uh, etc. for hours and hours and hours. This is focused on people. People um, um, and action and concrete action where um, every stakeholder need to come up with um, what he or she can and will commit to improve the food system, um, and it's from different uh, uh, from this different perspective. What will happen next week, Daniele, is that people are invited to have a conversation with each other who have never talked before. In the uh, question uh, box, there was a question on how to make sure that uh, that we can support the government against the multinational. You know, we um, should support the government to step up against them, but we should also make sure that we sit around the table with these multinational companies and ask them to uh, behave them their, uh, their behavior. And if they don't want to do it, to uh, uh, push them and to make sure that they are doing uh, 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 this. So it's a totally new approach and it will be very, very, very complicated. But you and me and everyone, we can think about leading from where we are, from breastfeeding, healthier, more diverse production, from making sure that farmers get a decent price, from being consumer that is preventing uh, food waste um, or buying locally. All these kinds of things will happen. Our own behavior can make a difference. And it's not the old enemies that are other people. It is ourselves who can lead. It is us that can lead the way. So we need to have the guts and, and the, the, the courage to say goodbye to a standalone approach from agriculture, from health, from social protection, 
and to really bring the complexity to the table and then find an entrance um, on which an action on which we can work together. Um, and it's not easy, but it's the only way forward. And you, um, um, you I, let me tell you this, once you have found this common uh, action and ground, and you are creating to, you are able to create success, it's the best breeder of more success. Celebrate it and then build on it. So um, you might think it's so complex, it's too complex, where do we start? But every end where you start is okay. That is the big lesson from the Sun Movement because we need each and every one. But it is about people, it is about our planet, and it is focused on pr prosperity um, uh, built by concrete action and collaboration with those people you've never been collaborating uh, with before. So go for it, because if we get food systems and nutrition right, we will inspire all other sustainable development goals and we'll be able to leave our planet and our society a better place for next generations. Thanks, Gerda. I think uh, we, as you said, we need to bring complexity and complexity does not need to be an excuse for us not to discuss and to identify uh, solutions. Um, uh, before I leave the floor to uh, Mr. Kuraya for a final remark, I also would like to, to say that we are privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Sean Baker, Chief Nutritionist, as uh, uh, you said. I think we can use some few minutes of extra time for, for your remark. Science, so we can have also um, uh, Mr. Baker's intervention, and then we can uh, have a wrap up and, and final closing of uh, of the webinar. Your thoughts on the pre, pre summit next week? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, the uh, the next week uh, we will discuss uh, broader issues. Uh, not only uh, not only limited to the nutrition issue, but also about the food security or uh, relation uh, between the agriculture or environment. Such various issues should be discussed. And uh, um, from a Japanese point of view, uh, as I said, the balanced food diet is quite important for all uh, countries, and Japan would insist on that as a paradigm. And that Thank you. So, Mr. Baker, uh, I can give you the floor for uh, a remark, and then I will uh, I will close uh, the webinar. I also thank uh, uh, all the speakers who have used the uh, uh, Q and A uh, um, section to reply to some of the answers raised. Uh, thanks also to the, to those who, uh, who made them. So, Mr. Baker, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Daniele, and I, you know, thank you to all the speakers today. Uh, a special thanks to Vice Minister Savini uh, and leading the G20. I think the Matero Declaration has been a huge uh, injection of energy into nutrition during this incredibly important year. And thank you, uh, Minister Correa and the governor of Japan for the incredible leadership on nutrition for growth. Um, I was trying, I was, as I was reflecting on everybody's comments, I think, Lena, you started out in mirror reinforced the projections of what the impacts of the pandemic could be on nutrition. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to remember that these are projections, these are not destiny. And I think it's incumbent on all of us to make sure these projections do not roll out and are not as grim as the numbers would indicate. I was stepping back because I think one of the questions was what can be the added value of G20 in this incredible important agenda of global nutrition? And when I step back, I look at the root causes of malnutrition, orphan, invisible, unmeasured, and voiceless. And I add now in the context of the pandemic, a fifth secondary, because so much of the rhetoric is, oh, it's a secondary effect, as if somehow kids dying from malnutrition now or who lost their potential during the pandemic, we can catch up later. And that's a false choice. And so to me, going back to voiceless and reasserting that nutrition cannot wait, I think, I believe, Lena, it was you who said it, or I, it may have been actually a toy at the beginning. The G20 represents the 20 biggest voices in the world. And more than ever, bringing those voices to the table consistently as the nutrition is a non-negotiable, nutrition cannot wait, nutrition 
of mothers and children is our future is probably the most important thing we can do. And going into nutrition for growth, I think we're incredibly, well, we're faced with probably the most devastating crisis for nutrition that I've certainly seen in my 40 years of working in public health nutrition. We're incredibly fortunate this year, we have two big bites at the apple with the Food System Summit and Nutrition for Growth to re-elevate, reassert, and re-energize the nutrition agenda. And I think going into nutrition for growth and others have laid this out, we have six key audiences, governments which need to step up in their domestic financing and their policies, bilateral donors uh, that, that need to not just keep the faith, but keep the faith glowing more strongly. We've spoken a lot about development banks, how important concessional financing is going to be in these times of, of straightened fiscal space. Uh, philanthropies also are constituting uh, constituting a more important part of the donor landscape. Uh, civil society obviously is incredibly important, not just for voice, but its role in implementing, its role in also bringing its own private fundraising and others have spoken to the private sector. So uh, I think that we have incredible opportunities to make sure those projections are not destiny. And I think it's conversations like this that bring everybody to the table to make sure that we can use this year to re-energize uh, and get back on track to meet the brilliant promises for nutrition for moms and kids around the world. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sean. I think uh, what you said, uh, going back to the voiceless and uh, uh, try not to make these projections destiny is uh, a fantastic message that we all need to, uh, to bring on board in our work, because as Gerda said, we can all be leaders uh, in our small activities and in, 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 in any kind of we work, uh, work uh, we, uh, we carry on and we, we, uh, we uh, are focused on. Uh, I'm very grateful. Uh, I feel uh, privileged that uh, I've had the chance to moderate this panel. Uh, all the issues and topics that have been raised have been extremely rich and inspiring. I really would like to thank uh, our colleagues from Action for making this possible. Uh, the speakers, uh, Bobby also for peer reviewing uh, uh, our, our paper. Uh, we will monitor very closely the next uh, uh, events that we mentioned today, the uh, UN Food System Summit, the, including the pre-summit, uh, the Nutrition for Growth uh, Summit, and we as a Think20 engagement group would be strongly advocating for a stronger role for food security and nutrition in our uh, T20 Summit uh, in early October. And we are also privileged that we will be working with the, the uh, Italian government in the Financing Commons Summit uh, uh, in uh, October uh, this year. Because I think, uh, as we all said today, we need to put and to connect uh, uh, all the dots uh, that nutrition uh, brings uh, uh, brings on when we speak about uh, food nutrition and, and food security. It's not only agriculture, but it's not only health. It's many, many dimensions uh, together. So we need the collective action, we need collective thoughts, and I'm really grateful because uh, thanks to your uh, speeches and interventions today, you helped us again to break up this complexity and not to hide uh, behind of it. So uh, thanks again for uh, being with us, and uh, we look forward to having uh, uh, with us in our uh, future uh, webinars, or hopefully at some point uh, physical events. And uh, uh, I wish you uh, all a nice afternoon and evening or night. And uh, uh, I hope.